Hello, this is Mrs. Condry. This is coronary artery disease and acute coronary syndrome from your Lewis chapter 34. Our objectives is that you will describe the pathophysiological changes, or I'm sorry, causes and effects of coronary artery disease. You will differentiate uh, the difference between angina, ischemia, and if infarction. You will be able to describe the normal variations and assessment findings in the cardiovascular system of the older adult, and you will define the nursing process for the client with coronary artery disease or CAD. What is CAD? Well, the CAD is deposits of lipids within the wall of an artery. And atherosclerosis is the major cause, and, and um, that comes about from endothelial injury and inflammation. And we do terrible things to our bodies to cause that injury. Tobacco, uh, we smoke, we have high cholesterol, we may have uncontrolled hypertension, we might have diabetes, we might get an infection, we might get exposed or take some toxins. Um, eat, we eat bad. So all those things can cause atherosclerosis. Um, and uh, amazingly enough, we start developing it at an early age. By f age 15, we can start developing atherosclerosis. So there are non-modifiable risk factors for, for CAD. And so that obviously that's things that we cannot change. We can't change how old we are. The higher, the older we get, the higher incidence we have of CAD. We can't change our ethnicity. Um, we just need to be more aware of it, that if you are um, a white middle-aged male, you have a higher incidence. Um, but even so, if you're an African-American male, you still need to be monitoring it because um, the, both the males and females have a higher death rate than whites. And, but that may be because they don't have uh, as many studies out there. It's more common to have CAD in males until age 64, 65, because of our uh, estrogen that has protected women. Um, but then after age 65, women have a higher death rate, just like in hypertension. And then we are definitely um, predisposed to CAD if you have a family history of it, especially if you have a mother who has had a heart attack at a young age. You're, you will be at much higher risk. So it's uh, estimated to be at 40 to 60 percent contributing factor. So these we things we cannot change, but these modifiable risk factors are things that we may be able to change. Um, diabetes increases our risk two to four times. But if we exercise and control our, um, ins our glucose, uh, we may be able to decrease that risk for it. Stress and depression increase our risk, um, especially depression, and uh, we need to um, maybe take antidepressants and exercise because exercise is found to be just as effective as an antidepressant. Stress is definitely a risk factor, especially those type A personalities. Smoking is a big risk factor. Physical inactivity, obesity, and if you take um, drugs such as cocaine or meth, um, that can produce coronary spasms and can cause uh, someone to have an MI. So how do we as nurses manage those things? We need to teach. We need to be doing smoking cessation teaching. We need to be promoting exercise, promoting good nutrition. And if that they need a lipid-lowering drug, to take those lipid-lowering drugs. And if they need to take an antiplatelet to um, uh, help decrease their risk, we need to promote that as well. So it's teaching paramount. So now let's go to angina. So I want to first talk about what is angina. Angina is a type of chest pain. It can be described as pressure, can be described as discomfort. But imagine I did this as a kid. I put a rubber band on my 
uh, pinky. I can't see the pinky in here. There we go. I put a rubber band on my pinky. And after a while, it starts hurting, right? That's because it's not getting enough oxygen. And that's what's happening to those coronary arteries. Because even though the, the heart is a muscle and it is contracting and getting blood to the body, it is supplied with oxygen by the coronary arteries on the outside of the heart. And if those arteries are blocked, it can cause angina. So when my, I was a kid, I took the rubber band off and whoo, the chest pain, my finger pain went away. With angina, um, it can go away if you maybe take uh, a nitroglycerin, which uh, helps dilate the artery so you can get more oxygen. But if it's completely blocked, say there's a clot in that coronary artery, that's when you're having a heart attack. Okay, so um, myocardial ischemia is um, not, the demand for though that oxygen is not being met by those coronary arteries, and that's angina. And it can be if the body needs more oxygen, say you're, you're out running, and your body needs more oxygen, or your heart needs more oxygen, but it's not getting it, then you can get some chest pain. Or you're not getting enough um oxygen. Say you have uh, anemia, decreased number of red blood cells that are carrying those oxygen um, molecules around. If you don't have enough of them, you can also get angina. So chronic stable angina is intermittent chest pain over a long period, but it's just intermittent and it goes away. It resolves when that precipitating factor is resolved. So in other words, if you get some chest pain and with your exercising and you stop the exercising and rest and it goes away, um, it could be chronic stable angina. And it's usually controlled with medications such as nitroglycerin and other types of antianginals that can be oral. So if someone is complaining of some chest pain, um, they will go in to see the doctor. The doctor will do a history and physical. They will do that 12 lead ECG, and they uh, will probably do a stress test. So it can be an exercise stress test, or it can be a nuclear stress test if they can't tolerate exercise. They'll have electrodes um, attached to their chest. They monitor um, the ECG and then they'll lay down on a table and take some pictures to see if there's any part of the heart that's not receiving enough oxygen. Uh, if that is not done, they may do an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart, and they may do a stress echo. So that's another test where the patient can exercise, and then they're checking um, the heart, uh, the blood flow and things to see if they're all also having some um, coronary artery blockage. They might do a, a, a CAT scan, which looks for calcium buildup. And if someone comes into the ER with chest pain, they'll do some lab studies, the troponin, CKMB, and lipid levels. And um, if uh, any of these tests are positive, they will proceed to for a cardiac catheterization. So we did talk about cardiac catheterizations during um, fundamentals. So now let's turn to collaborative care for that chronic stable angina. Uh, collaborative care is um, asp aspirin. So aspirin is an antiplatelet. It can help prevent platelets from clumping um, around those blockages in the coronary arteries. And nitroglycerin is a vasodilator and it decreases that preload so it doesn't have to work so hard. So here's a nice little cute um, picture uh, about sending up the nitroglycerin to open up those coronary artery diseases. So you can have those sublingual tablets, but you can also take uh, have a nitroglycerin patch. You can also take um, sustained released um, tablets. Um, that's uh, isosorbid. So, oh, and the nitroglycerin can cause severe hypotension. Um, it can, so the, the patient can also get a headache from that and have some syncope 
because uh, that's with the sublingual tablets. Um, they can get a syncope if their blood pressure drops too low. They also may receive um, the ACE inhibitors, which are the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. So that decreases their risk of a cardiac event by vasodilating the peripheral system. It's working on the peripheral system. But it also prevents or reverses ventricular remodeling of the heart. So even though ACE inhibitors, so angiotensin, um, it's blocking angiotensin 1 from getting converted to angiotensin 2, which occurs in the lungs, by the way, but it works on the peripheral vascular system. And um, in the long run, it, it can reverse that ventricular remodeling. So that's the heart itself, even though it's working on the peripheral vascular system. And then beta blockers um, work on the heart. They decrease myocardial contractility. They decrease the pulse. They decrease blood pressure. And it also works on the systemic vascular resistance. So it decreases myocardial oxygen demand. So beta blockers work on both the heart and the peripheral system. ACE inhibitors are just working on the blood pressure. They're working on the peripheral vascular system. But in the long run, it can uh, help the heart. Calcium channel blockers are uh, used if beta blockers are not tolerated, but they're also uh, good for African Americans. Um, they work on both the heart and the peripheral system. They, um, they vasodilate those coronary arteries and um, they decrease the myocardial contractility. So both beta blockers and calcium channel blockers can decrease heart rate and blood pressure, whereas the ACE inhibitors just decrease the blood pressure. And then there's a sodium current uh, inhibitor called, um, I never know how to say the generic name, but it's Renexa is the, is the uh, trade name. It treats chronic angina that is not controlled with other meds. It's very expensive, but it works quite well. Um, so if these drugs, both an ACE, a beta, and or a calcium, don't work to control that angina, they may put them on a Renexa. So now... Um, they, we turn to acute coronary syndrome. Acute coronary syndrome, the first um, subcategory is unstable angina. So we had chronic stable angina where it was um, short periods, intermittent, and it was controlled. Whereas unstable angina is new onset and it, it can occur at rest. Instead of just occurring when you're exercising, this can occur at rest. Or it's a worsening pattern of stable angina. So say the patient was stable, but all of a sudden they're getting it at rest instead of just with exercise. And it's an emergency. Um, the symptoms vary for women compared to men. So I have another slide shortly on that. Myocardial infarction is sustained ischemia. So that means that there is no oxygen uh, going to the, the cells and it can cause cell death. And thrombus, so that means our blood clot is responsible in 80 to 90% of those MIs. And cell death can occur after only 20 minutes. But it can take four to six hours for that entire thickness of the heart muscle to die. So that's why a heart attack is an emergency that they need to come, uh, they need to call 911 and come to the ER. They really shouldn't just bring themselves in a car to the ER, they need to be treated immediately by the paramedics. Okay, so signs of a heart attack are um, it can cause some lightheadedness. It can cause pain in the jaw, the neck, the chest. It can feel like an elephant sitting on the chest. It can just feel like squeezing that comes and goes. It can make uh, someone nauseous and feel like they want to throw up. They can throw up. Um, they can, it can cause some shortness of breath. It can cause uh, diaphoresis. And also with women, uh, just some women, but some, more, more than men, the women can feel tired, just extremely tired for days or weeks prior to a heart attack. And women may have just a heartburn, a cough, 
some uh, chest palpitations and lose their appetite. So in men, it's more of a sudden, uh, there's an elephant on my chest. With women, it's a more gradual, uh, I don't feel right, there's something wrong, I just don't know what it is. So the complications of an MRI are dysrhythmias, which, is, which are heart arrhythmias. Um, that's the most common complication, and it can occur in 80 to 90 percent of patients. It's the most common cause of death when someone has a heart attack, and it's usually uh, ventricular fibrillation. So that's why it's important for someone to call 911 when they're having symptoms of a heart attack, because if they are uh, in V-fib, the, they can be shocked back into a normal rhythm and not die. That's much better, isn't it? Um, so if someone has an anterior, so the back of the heart, uh, infarcts, it can cause complete heart plate block. I'm sorry. Um, heart failure is a complication of MI, which I will explain. I just didn't correct it here. Um, and it can also cause cardiogenic shock. Um, that is where there's, so the left ventricle, is the, the major muscle that, of the heart because it has to pump the blood to the rest of the body. And if that fails due to loss of oxygen and nutrients, um, it can cause shock. And there's a very high mortality, so lots of people can die from cardiogenic shock. And the treatment is um, they go to the cath lab and then they get put on a balloon pump, which helps to rest the heart. The balloon pump um, goes in through a, a femoral artery and it helps to support the heart so it can rest. Um, then also they need to control dysrhythmias and they give lots of drugs. Uh, another complication is an inf uh, infarcted um, myocardial wall. It can thin and bulge and so that's called a ventricular aneurysm. So that means that the again the, those bottom chambers it can thin and bulge and it possibly could rupture. So the diagnostic studies for MI are the ECG, it's the primary tool. So when someone has an ECG and it has changes in those ST segments, that elevation shows an MI, a myocardial infarction. When, when the um, ST segment is depressed, depression means ischemia. Ischemia means that there's a decreased oxygen but not necessarily uh, loss of oxygen. And there can be T wave inversion and that also shows ischemia. So when someone has unstable angina or a non-STEMI, so remember I talked about that last semester, that means it's a non-ST elevation MI. Uh, it doesn't show on an ECG, um, but if it's a non-STEMI it will show on those cardiac enzymes. Those are proteins that is that are released by that necrotic muscle. And so troponins are cardiac muscle specific and those levels increase in four to six hours after a heart attack. Usually with a non-STEMI it means that it's not a complete blockage. So say there's a, a blood clot but it's not completely blocked so it's still getting a little oxygen. So it doesn't show up on an ECG. Whereas a STEMI it means a complete blockage of that coronary artery. It shows up, they're in severe pain, and um, they need to go to the cath lab. So the CKMB and myoglobins are less specific for cardiac muscle damage, but they, the, I think it's the CKMB that shows up within two hours of um, a heart attack. So coronary angiography is a a heart cath. It's mandatory for a STEMI. They must get into the cath lab within um, an hour and a half. Um, they can do a coronary angiography for STEMI and for unstable angina, uh, and they usually do, but it's not mandatory immediately. You can wait. If it's if uh, someone comes in with chest pain and they have no negative troponins. In a negative EKG, they will most likely do that e exercise or nuclear stress test. Um, but if that is positive, so say the stress test is positive, they will probably still go ahead and do the heart cath. 
sometimes, especially with women, our, the stress test may show that it's positive. It's showing less um, oxygen to the heart. But our breasts get in the way. And so a lot of there's more uh, um, false positives on women because of our breast tissue. It gets in the way of the pictures. Um, but it, even if someone has a negative stress test, but they continue to have that um, ang unstable angina, they will probably um, soon end up sending that patient for a heart cath just because that's the gold standard. That's the de definite yes or no, I don't have coronary artery disease. Because a stress test is not as specific. They are, are about 80 to 90 percent um, accurate, but there are some for some reason, some patients who have coronary artery disease that it doesn't show up on the stress test or the stress test is positive and then they don't actually have coronary artery disease. So this is a picture of uh, the cardiac catheterization lab and um, you all should hopefully get an experience at some point during your uh, student career to go into the cath lab and just watch. So these are links to see a cardiac cath, and um, so I'm not going to take the time here, but I want you to take the time to look at those links. They're not very long. They're YouTube videos. So if someone has um, a blockage, they're going to do a balloon and stent and open up that blockage and suck out that clot. Um, but if someone had, say, unstable angina, and they uh, go to the cath lab and they find about 50% blockage. They're not going to do anything, they're just going to watch. Legally, they're, uh, the doctor's not allowed to put in stenting or ballooning unless they have at least 60 to 70% blockage because they can cause more harm. If they do have a stent, they need to give some type of blood thinner, heparin or um, uh, this is Angiomax is the, is the actual brand name. It's a direct thrombin inhibitor. Um, they give that during uh, the procedure when they go down into those coronary arteries and they must take antiplatelet medications for one year. And these are the drugs listed here. And they need to take aspirin usually indefinitely. So you as a nurse are going to take care of many patients who are pre and post heart uh, catheterization. So in as a pre-cath patient, you're going to check allergies, vital signs. You need to check if they're allergic to shellfish uh, and um, IVP dyes. So if they are allergic, they need to be pre-medicated and notify the physician. Um, we need to have labs on the chart. We need to have an ECG or EKG, and they need to usually be NPO. Uh, depending on the physician. Post catheterization, you're going to monitor the uh, access site. So it could be the wrist, uh, the radial artery, it could be the femoral artery, it could be a brachial artery. So we just need to monitor it, monitor the vital signs, monitor the cardiac rhythm, and um, assess the cath site for um, hematoma, for oozing. And if Either uh, any of the areas, if they have a hematoma or they have oozing, you as a nurse need to hold pressure on the site, on the not the site, I'm sorry, the pulse. So when it's a radial artery, um, you will see an, a hole on the wrist, but it's going to be below the actual pulse. So if you saw bleeding or a hematoma, um, you would want to hold pressure on the actual artery. Same thing in the femoral, same thing in the brachial. You're going to hold pressure on the pulse. Um, you want to maintain bed rest for two to six hours, depending on those orders, depending on the physician, depending on um, how big the access site was. The, the usual, go, usual French sheath is anywhere between four French and 12 French. Um, and the smaller the French, the smaller the size of the, that catheter. 
We need to assess the pedal pulses if they have a femoral artery site. And we need to assess the radial pulse and the ulnar pulse if they use a wrist. And the same thing with the brachial, you want to assess pulses below in circulation because we don't want, um, uh, like say they had a blood clot form and or plaque broke off and occluded an artery. We need to be checking those um, sites. If they have a radial site, they usually have a pl plastic bracelet that air is slowly released from. That's called a TR band. Um, we're going to teach patients who had uh, stents and balloons about their medications. We have to teach them about taking the aspirin and taking that antiplatelet drug for as long as the physician says, not just a regular GP telling them to stop it or say a dermatologist telling them to stop it. They always must check with a cardiologist because what can happen is the stent has these rough edges and if anybody stops taking their antiplatelet for the first year it takes um, the body that full year to build up a fibrin sheath over those rough edges. And so platelets, if they're not taking those antiplatelets, platelets can stick on those edges and can cause a heart attack. So here we are trying to prevent another heart attack and treat this heart attack. But if they don't take their antiplatelets, they can have a heart attack. So it's very important to take them. So if it's a drug-coated stent, they take antiplatelets for one year. But if it is a bare metal stent, it's only four weeks. And so those patients who may need surgery, say they had um, scheduled for knee surgery and knee replacement, but their stress test was positive and they went for a heart cath, they need a bare metal stent so that they are allowed to have their surgery in say six or eight weeks. Um, the bare metal stents don't have as good record uh, they have a much higher success rate with the drug-coated stents. But if you're in agony from your knee and need knee surgery, you don't want to wait an, a year for your knee surgery, so you, you would rather have a bare metal stent. So also we're going to monitor IV fluids. We want to make sure that they get their IV fluids to flush out their kidneys because that dye is really toxic. Now, if patient can, if they have multiple blockages, they may have, uh, they may recommend a coronary artery bypass graft, which is a cabbage. Uh, those, uh, a cabbage is for patients who fail medical therapy, or they might have left main disease, that means uh, blockage here on this left main, which is supplying the all of the arteries, supplying oxygen to all those arteries, or they have um, multiple, so say you have an um, occlusion in all three arteries or four arteries depending on the patient, you, they may recommend a cabbage, or they have diabetes. Diabetics show that, uh, the studies show that diabetics do much better with a cabbage versus a stent. So with a cabbage, the chest is opened up with a cardiopulmonary bypass um, the hooked up to them, that blood is sent to a pump where it's oxygenated and returned to the patient so that the heart is quiet while the surgeon works on it. Um, so there are, I'm just going to go back over to this one first. There's minimally invasive bypasses that are done. I know at homes they're doing that. They used to open up the chest completely but now they're going into the side um, and it's a little easier to to recover from. It's still difficult. Um, so here it's saying it was um, it's done on a beating heart using mechanical stabilizers and the, here in your book it was saying for patients with a weak heart, kidney disease, severe lung disease, or high risk for stroke. But it just depends on the facility and how uh, up to date they are. So the arteries they use, so what they do is say there's a blockage here, so they're going to take an, an artery, usually the internal mammary artery, and hook it into the aorta and bypass that um, diseased area. 
They have very good luck, um, long-term patency rate of 90% after 10 years with this internal mammary um, artery. But they also often use the saphenous vein grafts. The patency isn't as good. And think about the difference between an artery and a vein. Um, the patency rate is only 50 to 60% after 10 years. And the patient does uh, use antiplatelets and statin drugs to improve um, the, that record. Usually a patient symptom-free after a cabbage for 10 to 15 years, but they need to change their lifestyle. Lots of times patients will change their lifestyle for a short time. After a while, they'll just get back to their normal life. But um, eating bad, um, not exercising, all those things can, again, cause that damage. So you as a nurse, if you're caring for a cabbage patient, um, if you're in the ICU, um, they will have um, a ch several chest tubes. They will be in ICU for 24 to 36 hours. They'll be on many drugs. They'll usually be a one-to-one -one, um, patient because there's a lot to take care of. In the step-down unit, um, they're going to be on a cardiac monitor. You're going to monitor that chest tube, and they'll have temporary pacemaker wires um, underneath their, ch their uh, left chest area or sticking out here, um, and that's if they need to have a hook them up to a temporary pacer uh, because fooling around with the heart can cause a lot of dysrhythmias. We also want to control their pain. We need to monitor their labs and replace their electrolytes, give those IV fluids, um, and we also want to give those cardiac meds, so especially beta blockers, to slow that heart rate down. 20 to 50 percent of post-cabbage patients have atrial fibrillation, so they will need anticoagulation in that case. We need to care for those incisions, both the sternum or the lower um, site and the donor sites. So if they had um, saphenous vein grass, they're going to have sites in their legs that you will need to care for too. We need to teach about early ambulation. They need to use an incentive spirometer, walk so they don't get DVT, monitor for signs of infection and teach them signs of infection, teach them about their discharge medications and lifestyle changes. So some patients will go home, but if they're not strong enough, they will go to uh, rehab, and they really should have cardiac rehab no matter if they're going home or not, um, to teach them um, some more about diet, exercise, that kind of thing. The drug therapy for uh, acute coronary syndrome and angina are, is first aspirin, which is the antiplatelet unit, uh, agent, sorry, um, if the patient has aspirin, um, if they have suspected MI, they would want to take chew a 325 milligram tablet. Sometimes after a PCI, which is the stenting or cabbage, they will order 81, but sometimes they'll order 325, so they just need to follow the instructions. These are the antiplatelets, the three antiplatelets that are out there on the market. They inhibit platelet aggregation. It's mandatory for one year for a drug-coated stent and four weeks for a bare metal stent. They will get um, IV nitroglycerin if they have chest pain. It, it's a vasodilator. Um, decreases that chest pain and decreases both preload and afterload. But hypotension is a very common side effect, and they, a headache is a terrible side effect. Morphine is a vasodilator, and it's a drug of choice to relieve chest pain. It does decrease the myocardial oxygen demand. And then I've already talked about these drugs in the, um, a couple of pages back, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and um, anti-dysrhythmic meds. So if someone has, say, atrial fibrillation, they may get placed on an um, anti-dysrhythmic med. So lipid-lowering agents are important um, for all patients going home after a cabbage, a balloon, and a stent. 
It's a mandatory thing that all patients sh should receive one, whether they have elevated LDLs or triglycerides or not. It's the standard of care, uh, regardless of their lipid levels. The book says those with elevated um, LDL or triglycerides should receive one, but the standard of care uh, now states that everyone getting any of these um, interventions should receive one. MONA is the acronym often used for managing chest pain. It means morphine, oxygen, nitro, and aspirin. But really the correct order to treat chest pain is that the patients should sit up. We want to assess their pain. We give oxygen. Um, we get an ECG. We give nitro. We give morphine if needed, depending on if the nitro worked. And we listen to their uh, heart and lung sounds. The book doesn't mention aspirin, but it is given in the emergency room and emergently when going to the cath lab. So that was a long lecture about the pathophysiological causes and effects of coronary artery disease. So I'm going to flip way back to the beginning to review that um, it's from atherosclerosis, which are deposits of lipids within that wall, and it's from endothelial injury and inflammation, which is caused by our bad living, also genetics. So those modifiable, non-modifiable risk factors, we can't do anything about. However, we can do something about those modifiable ones, and that's our job as nurses to teach about it. So the difference between chronic stable angina, unstable angina, and MI, let's go over that. Chronic stable angina is intermittent chest pain over a long period with but they short duration. And it resolves, say, if the patient's exercising, they stop, it goes away. Unstable angina is when the patient um, is it's an on new onset. It, it can occur at rest or it's a worsening pattern. So say it was stable, now it's becoming unstable. They need to get uh, go to the hospital to get checked out. An MI is where there is um, sustained ischemia to that heart muscle. So it's a heart attack. And I just have to get to the end again. Oops. So then the normal variations and assessment findings in the cardiovascular system of the older adults. So um, as we age, our blood pressure is higher. Our, um, we can get more dysrhythmias. Uh, we can have um, more risk of heart attacks. And um, I talked about the difference in genetics and age. And we'll talk about the nursing process in class. So that is it. I will see you soon in heart failure.